Okay, and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about early modernism. This is going to be a speed run through the first half of the 20th century. We're just going to hit the highlights. We're just going to find out the achievements that were unlocked and how this led to contemporary art. Because before we can talk about contemporary art, we have to talk about what it's reacting to. Some of the things in contemporary art since the 60s have been extensions of ideas that were created in the 20th century, like Dadaism, for example, and some are repudiations or revolts against some of the things that were created in the first half of the 20th century, such as non-objective abstraction. So I gotta tell you where all those jump in. So we're gonna move fast and furious, and there's no better place to start than with the excellent PowerPoint uh, skills that I present in this slide. Uh, this wonderful early modern timeline. Would you believe that once upon a time I was a graphic designer and I actually paid my way through college uh, with my graphic design skills? I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, I made the right choice to go into art history and I couldn't agree more. So let's talk about this. One of the things I like about this chart is I'm not going to go through every detail, but it gives you immediately a sense of how incredibly diverse the era was. It was not an era of a single movement or a single idea. There were literally dozens and they were all happening virtually simultaneously. You have the Society of Independent Artists form. They start performing an annual salon. This gives experimental and modern artists a place to display their art and we just see it explode from there. It's also a period of ideologies. Every single one of these movements practically has a manifesto or a magazine. Hey, it was an age of manifestos. We had anarchists and progressives and socialists of all kinds. There were all kinds of political manifestos. Why shouldn't the artists have their own political manifestos? And some of these manifestos are intensely political and uh, ideologically driven. Just wait till we get to the futurists. That's going to be great fun. Uh, if I have to break this up into two periods, the period leading up to 1913, particularly this period between 1910 and 1913, is this incredible experimental age where people are pushing towards pure abstraction and pushing towards non-objective abstraction. We'll talk about what we mean by that. And so that's the kind of golden moment where if you want to say this is where modern art came into its own this is that time period and like all things that come into their own they have to have a coming out party so if there's a quinceanera for modern art it's going to be the armory show which happens in 1913 and it's where modern art is introduced to america and it marks the point where we see a shift paris had been the center of the art world for most of the 19th century and by the early 20th century, we see the shift moving to New York and elsewhere. So everything was leading up to this experimental moment. It was a time of incredible experimentation. And then we have World War I, the Great War, and following immediately on the heels of that, the Spanish flu pandemic, which was far more devastating than the current pandemic. But maybe you can have a little bit of sympathy for the significant historical events, just having lived through uh, this relatively minor pandemic by comparison. So this was a tumultuous age. Empires fell, there were revolutions, massive social upheaval, war trauma and shock. And so after World War I and during World War I, you see a change in the art. Before this, everything is about the aesthetic, the form, pushing the boundaries of art. After that, it's kind of a reaction to the social upheaval of the era and the response to it. How do we create that? Then as we get out of World War I and into the 20s, you're going to see people kind of solidify. That is, we have this explosion of society, everything falls apart, and it's like, okay, let's pick the pieces back up together. What is modern art gonna be? And it kind of goes into a solidification period in between the two wars where it centers around the ideas of abstraction and surrealism, and that becomes the ground from which mid-century modern is created. So as I mentioned, let's just dive right into this. We now, 1903, have the Society of Independent Artists forming an annual salon. It happens in the fall, since it's, hence it's the Salon de Autumn, and it becomes a place where experimental avant-garde artists can break out. 
And it's several occasions. 1905, the Fathers break out. 1910, 1911, the Cubists break out. And so you can really see this happening, this kind of building energy. So let's start with the Fathers. The Fathers are the first to really break out. If there's the uh, a definitive, you know, kind of early modern movement that breaks out, it's got to be Fathism. Fathism is named because they painted in this what was characteristically a wild style with a kind of violent form and arbitrary color. And a critic came by and there was a statue in the middle of the gallery and the statue was of a classical work. And he just said, oh, this is a Donatello amidst the wild beasts. And the wild beasts he was talking about were all these Fauvist painters. That's where we get the word Fav. Fav just means wild beast. Well, who isn't going to glom on to a sexy title like that? So it's like, yeah, hurt me some more, baby. Uh, call me a, a wild beast. I'll take it. So that's where they get the name. Almost all of these guys came out of the studio of Gustave Moreau, which is interesting. So this really wild, ecstatic, symbolist painter uh, gives birth to these guys. And the chief amongst them is going to be uh, Matisse. And right away, you can see what I mean. The line is all over the place. The color is even more so. What are we looking at? Some figures are pink, some are blue, some shadows are rendered in red, some shadows are red and rendered in green. And there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. The color does not follow nature. Even in the post-impressionist phase, even as experimental as Van Gogh was getting, stars were still yellow and white and skies were still blue and Wheat was still, you know, buff tan, and trees were still green, but not anymore. Color becomes arbitrary. It's whatever you need to show the movement. Hence, we have the blue nude, because, again, it's going for a mood, and he's using the color to create mood. He didn't paint his whole studio red. <laughs> he uses red as this color indicating vitality, life, creativity, and it just renders everything else out flat. You could see this same arbitrary use of color in the works of Drain, where you see shadows rendered as red or purples, and you can also see that same just incredible energetic brushstroke in uh, Georges Rouault's uh, Wonderful Head of Christ, where he just kind of attacks this. So. What do we get out of Fauvism that's going to ultimately lead to the mid-century? This is the push towards abstraction. You're seeing this expressive quality, this push towards abstraction. Another group that adds to this is going to be the German Expressionists. Now, the German Expressionists give us two camps. The first is De Brucke, and the other one is the Blue Rider. Let's talk first about uh, De Brucke. De Brucke is the bridge. And they actually pull this title from a work by Friedrich Nietzsche. Yes, Friedrich Nietzsche, who was a nihilist and a German philosopher, spent the rest of his life in an asylum, went nuts. Uh, but he wrote this book called Thus Spake Zarathustra. And the whole premise of the book is that mankind is nothing but a bridge to the future. That is, man is in a constant transitory state. Remember how I said transitive is a quality of contemporary art? We are always changing. We are always becoming. There's always something better. And we are a bridge to the future. And this was a, a, a great metaphor. And these artists, uh, such as Kirchner and others, really uh, thought this was a beautiful metaphor. And so this is, in, in uh, Nietzsche's view, this is the way to create the ubermensch, the supermen that are past the moral considerations, because we bridged over them. And so they take this title to describe this, and they write a manifesto, and it says, we call all young people uh, together, and as for young people who carry the future in us, we want to wrest freedom for our actions and our lives from the older, comfortably established forces. Okay, boomer. Yeah, so, I mean, good grief, you could put that on Instagram or Facebook today. Uh, it would be, or Snapchat, I guess Facebook is for boomers. Uh, it reads just as well today. And it, again, describes the avant-garde, it describes modernism as something deliberately challenging the past in deliberately revolutionary terms. So when we look at their artwork, it's going to be incredibly expressive. It's Kirchner's is going to do street scenes that have high angular lines, lurid colors, greens where there shouldn't be greens and face tones. It's going to be busy street scenes, you know, compelling things like that. And these are Germans, so they have a lot of history and they go back to their history when they decide to look for inspiration. 
Germany was the site of uh, really some of the earliest woodcut and woodblock printing in the Western world, down there in Nuremberg and elsewhere. And so they look to the woodcut and they revitalize the woodcut. Now the woodcut is a cheap medium, it's not an expensive medium, and the great thing is you can print multiple copies. So they print books and pamphlets because if you're a movement, you want to get your ideas out there, so this was a way to disseminate them. And as you can see, they embrace this kind of primitive aesthetic going back to the Middle Ages. We can see the influence of the Expressionists on many other painters who weren't necessarily part of the bridge movement. For example, uh, Oscar Kokoschka wasn't a part of it, but you can see that same violent, abstract, edgy brushwork, the angular brushwork. In this case, Kokoschka, this is probably a self-portrait with him and the widow of Gustav Mahler, the very famous uh, composer. Gustav Mahler died and he fell in love with uh, his widow, but she didn't, wouldn't marry him. And so the tempest here is this emotional tempest. What a better way, what a great way to describe emotional tension, but through this agitated, expressive brushwork. So when we get to the mid century and we see abstract expressionism, you can see that energy of brushstroke in a de Kooning or uh, in a Klein. So then we get to the Blue Rider group. So the Blue Rider group is made up of a number of individuals, uh, Franz Mark and also Vasily Kandinsky. Kandinsky is a Russian, but he's a Russian expat. He's active in Germany, he's living in Germany. And they actually, again, put together a movement. Kandinsky painted a painting that had a tiny little uh, uh, rider wearing blue out in a field. And to him, it became a spiritual metaphor. And for him, color, was spiritual. You put the color down that makes you feel the kind of spiritual emotion that you want to feel. So that blue rider became the name, that famous painting of his became the name for their movement. And they produced an almanac, and the almanac gave a bizarre collection of sources. It was, it had a article on Cubism. Cubism was starting right around the same time. It also had German woodcuts, so it was looking back to that ancient past and current uh, woodcut revival, but it also had Chinese paintings, which is a non-Western specialist I find fascinating, because Chinese paintings are uh, done in ink washes, and they're very expressive. So you can see they were looking for sources for things that were more inherently expressive and spiritual. For Franz Marc's part, he actually loved the symbolism of these blue horses. Well, of course, there's no such thing as blue horses, I guess I got to give a shout out to the My Little Pony fans out there. So fellow brony, mad respect. Uh, but this isn't Rainbow Dash. This is a horse that is blue because blue is a spiritual color. And so clearly we're not looking at a real horse. We're looking at some spiritual message. Now, Kandinsky more than anybody else is given credit for pushing abstraction to the level of non-objective representation. What do I mean when I say non-object? Actually, non-objective representation is an oxymoron. It's just non-objective art is what I should say. Well, his artwork was getting even more expressive and even more abstract. Abstract means it doesn't look like it looks in nature. You stylize it. But here, even though this is very abstract with its loose brushstrokes, its knobbly paint and all the, the wonderful characteristics it have, it's still an identifiable object. You can see the chimney, you can see a factory, he's painting a landscape. But if you didn't know that, you would almost begin to lose this object and it would start to turn into just color and light. And Kandinsky had a certain amount of envy for music because in music, no one ever asks you, well, what is this piece of music about? That's a piece of music. Music can be purely abstract. It doesn't have to have a narrative. It doesn't have to have a story. And he said, why can't art be like that? So he started borrowing terms from musical uh, you know, composition. He started calling his paintings compositions or improvisations. And he kept pushing and he realized the thing that's holding me back is the figuration. I'm still representing objects. And we generally give Vasily Kandinsky credit for creating the first non-objective paintings. Now, when you look at this painting, you can see color, you can form, you can see shape. But if you see anything in this that looks like a figure, that's just you, that's your imagination, because Kandinsky didn't intend for you to see anything in this. This is purely a formal exercise in light, color, shape, tone, texture. 
That is, it is completely non-objective. And somewhere between 1911 and 1912, Kandinsky painted the first of his non-objective paintings. And it's the first time in human history that someone created something that had no object in mind, that was just pure expression. Now, he still crafting this as an artist. He's like, okay, we need more blue here, etc. But he's just thinking in terms of composition, color, tone, depth, energy, texture, all of those things. He's not trying to create an actual image. And we give him credit for this. And the thing is, is a lot of people were pushing in this direction. The Cubists were doing this at around the same time. Uh, and Delaunay, Robert Delaunay, who was a um, French Cubist, he was actually pushing this, but we generally think that it's Kandinsky that got there first. For a while there, there was a speculation that Delaunay got there first, but then we discovered that Delaunay was actually uh, dating his paintings earlier than he painted them. There's a few famous paintings that he redated them to 1910 and 1911, and they were actually 1912 and 1913. <laughs> Sneaky. <laughs> Trying to take credit for it. Because after it happened, everybody knew what a significant thing it was, so he... He changed the dates on his paintings, uh, or he had paintings he didn't have dates on, and he put dates on them, and the dates are the dates we know are wrong. So again, mid-century modernism, abstract expressionism, Jackson Pollock. This is the grandfather to Jackson Pollock, and those ideas of pure abstraction. The movement that captures most people's attention, the movement that most people think does the most to move us in the direction towards abstraction is cubism. So cubism is a movement that starts in France and it has a energetic uh, base and it has a number of different varieties. It goes through a very rapid evolution and then it pretty much wraps up by the early 20s. But in that time, the creative output is just astonishing. In 1910, the first cubist pieces start being uh, displayed at the Fall Salon on the Society of Independent Artists. By 1911, everybody's painting in a Cubist style. And then you actually have a kind of revolt. By 1912, the Cubists are fighting wars amongst each other. So some of the Cubists go off to make the, um, uh, uh, the Sector d'Or, the, 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 uh, a totally kind of splinter group. Uh, that's how popular it becomes. But it does have an inventor, and those inventors are going to be Pablo Picasso and George Brock. So Pablo Picasso is a Spanish artist, and he comes to Paris because Paris is the center of the art world. And he comes there to get training, spoke very little French, almost none. And he runs into a, a character by the name of Max Jacobs, who has worked with art dealers, works as an art critic and a writer. And Max Jacobs offers to teach him French. And so he teaches him French. Then Max Jacobs introduces him uh, to Guillaume uh, Apollinaire. Apollinaire is a art critic and a poet and he knows all of the people in the avant-garde so he introduces Picasso around and that's where Picasso gets introduced to Brock and the two form a very tight partnership over the next few years and together they create cubism but it doesn't happen all at once so when Picasso first gets there he's painting mostly in the style of an expressionist and again using color arbitrarily to depict mood he has his blue period and there you can see a self-portrait and then he has his rose period where he uses more rose or red colors. This painting is probably a response to a poem by Apollinaire. They were such good friends he would illustrate the poem. But the figures are saltimbanks. Saltimbanks are jonglers, harlequins, performers. These are, you know, street performers, uh, buskers, screevers, and all them are dang old-fashioned words. You know, oh my gosh. Uh, I sound like McGucket off of uh, Gravity Falls. Anyhow, moving on. Uh, and this is a theme that Picasso will use his entire life. To him, these Harlequin represented outsiders, uh, people who look who were living out on the fringes of society. And there's a certain kind of tradition that if you were an outsider, you can see inside better than somebody inside can. And it gives you a certain vision. And he adopts the form of the Harlequin to represent himself. So this is almost like these symbolist pieces. It's very similar to these uh, late symbolist pieces by Gauguin and others as well. So he was more or less in the vein of what other people in, in France uh, and Paris were painting at the same time. But he has a kind of breakthrough, and it starts, again, uh, his friend Apollinaire uh, manages to get a hold of some statues. And here's one of them. 
And these statues actually came from uh, Iberia, and they're actually pre-Roman. They're very ancient. These are ancient Spanish sculptures, and they tend to have this mask-like face. And he thought, hey, you know, Picasso was frustrated that he wasn't making any headway, and he said he's Spanish, so he might appreciate these, so he gave him these. And it's really a kind of a fascinating story, because it later turned out these were stolen from the Louvre, and they had to be returned to the Louvre. But for a time, they were in the possession of Picasso. And Picasso was just captivated, both because of the Spanish heritage that he shared with these sculptures, but because how simple they were. And that was what he was looking for. And so you can see his paintings change dramatically. Uh, I mean, this is his painting of himself in 1906, and you can see he has this very mask-like, stylized face. You can compare that to this portrait. You know, uh, it's really kind of interesting. I wonder which one he'd pick for Tinder. Uh, at any rate, so going ahead, uh, that really changed him. It started to think, have him thinking in this mode of looking towards more primitive sources. And then two big things happened at the same time. First is Cezanne died. Cezanne dies and a massive retrospective is held in his honor. And we know that Picasso went to look at that. And seeing that, he saw how Cezanne was breaking down the human form, how Cezanne had just stopped giving a flying crap about whether his figures actually made sense anymore or looked like humans, mixing and matching parts, making it hard to see, breaking things down into polygonal shapes. And that was very inspiring to him. And the other thing that was very inspiring is he went to an exhibit here at the Museum of Ethnography at the Trocadero Palace in Paris. France was a major colonial power. They were bringing back a lot of African art. And it appears that uh, Picasso saw this. In fact, we have some photos of him in his studio with uh, some African art. People have identified these two figures in the background as a Dogon uh, couple. Dogon is a tribe from Mali that carved these. Uh, but there's some other possible identifications as well. So that all comes together in 1906, 1907. He paints this painting, which ostensibly is uh, a group of prostitutes in a brothel that are nude, awaiting their, you know, tricks, if you will. And yet, boy, is it strange. Uh, the drapery is broken into angular forms and glass-like shapes. The faces are either mask-like faces or they're these strange, frightening faces, which are clearly based on African masks, African masks that he had probably seen in that collection. Now, this painting caused a sensation, even though it wasn't publicly displayed until 1911. But people heard about this and said, I got to go see this. And he was realizing that he had stumbled into something he knew not what. And everybody came by. Um, uh, Edgar Degas, who had essentially retired from art in the 1880s, uh, heard about it and he had to come see it as something new, as something revolutionary. And it's at this time that his friend, uh, Brock, starts experimenting his own way, copying pictures by Cezanne. And he copies pictures by Cezanne, and he takes Cezanne's kind of cubic forms and really makes them cubic, making them looking like prisms. And this is where cubism gets its name, that you render things into cubic forms. And this is the kind of breakthrough. Somewhere around 1908, 1909, they start painting these things, and then they start creating what we call analytical cubism. Analytical cubism is where you look at a figure or an object and you break it into these planar shapes, almost like you're looking through fractured glass, showing different sides of the figure as you go. And they weren't above pandering. Uh, one of the most famous and successful gallery owners at the time uh, was interested in this, and so they painted a picture of him. Uh, it's actually a pretty accurate portrait, even though it breaks him into uh, kind of glass-like shapes. And what's interesting about analytical cubism is that it tends to be monochromatic. It tends to have real depth and form. There's a figure there. So it's very abstract, but it's not non-objective. But they push the boundaries even further. Until 1911, 1912, they're painting things like this. Believe it or not, this is, it looks purely abstract, but it's not because it's actually a painting of uh, Picasso's lover, uh, Marcel Humbert. Uh, and his pet name for her was Ma Jolie, or My Pretty, which was the name of a popular song. So if you miss this thing on a test, and when the name is written right there, you deserve to fail. I'm sorry. Uh, but it also has things like a treble clef. It has musical notes. It has symbols and references. It vaguely has a sense of a form, and there is a sense of 
depth, but it has all of this complexity. So people looked at this stuff and they absolutely fell in love with it. So 1910, the first Cubist works start being publicly shown. By 1911, uh, Metzinger, Ferdinand Leger, everybody is jumping in on this and sees this as a real revelation. Metzinger is my favorite uh, Cubist, by the way, a vastly underrated Cubist. Uh, and he wrote an, the first real treatise on this and why it was significant. That he said it allows you to push painting into the um, fourth dimension. You get to show a sense of time. You get to show the figure from multiple perspectives. And I picked this painting because you can see it right here. That we're seeing the teacup from the side in this way, but we're looking at it from the top over here. It gives you this kind of multiplicity. And this, I didn't realize this, but this concept of multiple perspectives is something that we know from quantum physics, but it actually started in the arts first. Metzinger is the first to actually uh, write about it. And Niels Bohr was a, read that article, became a great fan of, of, of Metzinger's, and he actually purchased a painting of his and put it up in his study. And when he was working on quantum mechanics, he had that painting in his study and was working uh, at the same time. And so the idea, and, and that works perfectly for quantum mechanics because there was this problem. Sometimes when you look at a particle in quantum mechanics, it looks like a particle and sometimes it behaves like a wave and no one can tell why it does it. In fact, it seems to know when you do it and it depends on how you look at it. And so this art actually helped him to kind of see the inherent contradictions. So there's a little bit of history of science for we break from art history. Uh, but as I mentioned, everybody got into this. Uh, Chagall was, a again, a Russian painter, a Jewish-Russian painter, but was active in France. And he blended in his own kind of folklore and history, adding elements of fantasy, pulling these pieces together. Uh, so everybody was creating in this. But Picasso and Brock were not going to rest on their laurels. They continued to innovate and push forward. So not only have we moved towards greater and greater abstraction, but we start to move to experimental materials and media. Picasso actually starts doing crazy things like putting shelf paper into his paintings. You know, shelf paper that you, there was this thing called oil paper, which was oiled paper that had a printed motif on it. So it looked fancy, so you could protect your shelves and flat wooden surfaces. Uh, from the accidental spill, and he starts taking this out of the hardware store and putting it into his paintings. He even starts creating these soft constructions out of cardboard. Now remember, sculpture is supposed to be bronze, marble, hard, durable materials, high quality materials. To start making things out of cardboard is really revolutionary. So again, when we start thinking about the contemporary era, when we think about the post-minimalists and they start using felt and latex and all kinds of crazy stuff that stuff is really going to be looking back to this period of experimentation of bringing new media into the fore uh, Delaunay for his part he may not have invented uh, non-objective abstraction but he jumps into this and he creates orphism which is all about these beautiful color harmonies but look he slaps this thing over the frame so the painting has escaped the boundaries of the picture plane and now spills out over the frame. So would we start thing, seeing things like Rauschenberg, where Rauschenberg starts taking things off the picture plane and starts painting onto chairs attached to the canvas or these taxidermy uh, things. Again, these ideas fundamentally had their origin in this incredible time of experimentation. Now, as significant and as important as Cubism was, it didn't have a very long life, largely because World War I happens. World War I happens, everybody reevaluates their priorities. And we go through a brief period known as the return to order. <laughs> and it's this sense that things went really off the rails. You know, we were youthful kids, we were having fun, and then all of civilization collapsed. Four empires disappeared in a, in, in a matter of years. Uh, the Russian Revolution happened. Uh, all of this death and horror. And then the Spanish uh, flew on top of it, which wasn't Spanish, it was actually American, but Spain wasn't involved in the war and America was. So America suppressed the fact that the, the flu happened in America, but Spain didn't, so we called it the Spanish flu. Eh, misnomers. Nothing in history is named correctly. We'll just keep going. Uh, and he cr starts creating stuff like this. He, he starts, uh, Picasso starts saying, hey, you know, maybe we need to pull back from the edge. <laughs> we need to pull back from these youthful indiscretions. He starts doing things that are more 
neoclassical, looking to classical traditions, but ultimately it's unsatisfying too. Picasso is the only person that really sticks with the Cubist style much longer after World War II. A few others experiment with it. Uh, surrealism comes along and it offers so many more opportunities, it just explodes. And Picasso, for his part, kind of blends into surrealism. I always look at this thing as the epitaph of Cubism. Uh, because it tells such a poignant story. There's two versions of this, one's in the Philadelphia Museum and one's in the Museum of Modern Art. And this is the one occasion where, if there's two copies of something, I prefer the one in the Museum of Modern Art. All other occasions, Philly rules, Philly's the best. Go to the Philly Museum before you go to anywhere else, it's the best. Uh, but in this case, I do like this one a little bit better. And it shows three performers. Now, the center one is painted like a Harlequin. Who's the Harlequin? He's the outsider who can see the truth of the world. This is Picasso, and it looks like him. It has this kind of grizzled face, and it holds a guitar. Uh, and on one side of him is a flautus, and the flautus is a representation of Apollinaire, his good friend. Apollinaire died in the Spanish flu epidemic. On the other side is Max Jacob. Max Jacob was the poet and uh, who tutored uh, uh, Picasso in, Fran in French, and he ultimately kind of had a crisis of faith. He was Jewish, but he converted, uh, but he was a secular Jew, but he converted to Catholicism and he became a priest. And so here he is depicted as a monk and he just left. So this is Picasso, you know, sitting here basically describing how, you know, this little circle that had invented Cubism had completely disintegrated. And while he would never completely abandon Cubism, he would integrate it with kind of dreamscape and nightmare imagery that comes from surrealism. Most famous example of that being La Guernica, which is a perfect use of it because it documents the bombing of this city in the Spanish Civil War, where the nationalist government of Spain asked the Nazis to come in and destroy this town. And so you have this monochromatic destruction. It's really uh, quite moving. But he never really evolved in style after that. It's amazing for as famous as Picasso is, he lived till 1972. It's just kind of weird to think that I drew breath in the same planet with Picasso. Picasso seems like this ancient, he might as well be Hercules or Achilles. But I drew breath with Picasso. And he died in 72. I was born. <coughs> and, um, uh, uh, and he, uh, it's amazing. But he really did not have that much great of an impact on art past that initial genius moment of cubism which brings us to futurism uh, futurism is a similar movement but it's happening in italy and a little bit in switzerland and futurism is a holistic movement it wasn't just a movement of artists it was a movement of writers fashion designers designers thinkers uh, creators feminists it was crazy crazy radical and it started by the poet uh, marinetti and he writes this uh, manifesto and the manifesto is bat guano insane and it basically says that you know hey the new world is what we should hold up as the example for our art and our culture let me read just a few things from this manifesto number four on the manifesto is we affirm that the beauty of the world has been enriched by a new form of beauty the beauty of speed a racing car with a hood that glistens with large pipes resembling a serpent with explosive breath. A roaring automobile that seems to ride on grape shot. That is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. How pretentious and arrogant is that? It's just pure unbridled chauvinism. Pure triumphalism of the modern era. And that was it. And so everything was built on speed, technology, movement. Uh, it was also kind of nationalistic and uh, just a tad fascist. Let me read uh, item number nine. Um, item number nine says, we will glorify war, the world's only hygiene. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How, holy crap. <laughs> uh, they would change their opinion of that in short order. World War I, the horrors of World War I, of, of uh, gas attacks and trench warfare and machine guns and all the horrors of war would change their opinion abruptly of that. Uh, they they got a full snootful of the of the uh, of the world's only hygiene, and they didn't want to glorify it anymore. But it it impacted every aspect of society. There were futurist manifestos for women. This one is uh, written by uh, Valentin du Saint-Point. Uh, Saint and the, I love the opening of this. Uh, she basically says humanity is mediocre. The majority of women are neither superior nor inferior to men. The majority of men, they are equal. Both merit the same disdain. <laughs> 
it's like it's like the most emo high school poetry you've ever read in your life and we keep going it's like women too long corrupted by morals and conventions return to your sublime instinct to violence and cruelty good gravy it, it reads like a billy eilish song so uh, uh billy eilish if you're looking for material turn this into a song uh just make sure you credit travis lee clark art history with travis lee clark all i want is a mention as crazy as some of that is is this whole upturning of society uh, my favorite example of this is the futurist cookbook the futurist cookbook actually has recipes for how you were supposed to understand uh you know food in the modern era i will just uh, i will just give you a, a taste of this uh, uh dad jokes they just come out of me naturally i don't try to do this people anyhow uh, one of my favorite is a tactile dinner. In the tactile dinner, people would come into a room and there would be pajamas. And the pajamas would be covered with things like cork or felt or sandpaper. And you would then choose your pajamas and put it on. And then you would go into a dark room. And then you would feel through the room until you found a partner and selected your partner on the basis of how they felt. And then you would go out of the room and see your partner for the first time. And then the two of you would sit down to dinner. And then they would put lettuce and greens into a machine that would had a crank and the crank would play like organ grinder music and the lettuce greens would come out and you would eat it as it dropped into your mouth. And while you did this, all of the waiters would dance until that part of the meal was finished. And you had to do this all without cutlery. And it just it keeps going on. And it's a bizarre thing, and it imagines that the eating experience should be more than just food. It should be a whole collection of tactile experiences. Now, they never, they hardly did any of these things, but this is the roots of performance. When we get to performance in the 60s and 70s, these crazy performances, this idea of thinking of something as an experience rather than something that is an object has its roots in futurism. As far as futurist painting goes, futurist painting is, you know, built around the concept of motion, speed, those kind of things. So here you have Giacomo Balla and the dynamism of a dog on a leash. This is inspired clearly by Muybridge's kind of photos and photography that showed motion. One of my favorite examples of this is Boccioni's States of Mind. The Farewell. This, again, is an experiment in time, the fourth dimension, which the fourth dimension was first created by artists in their writings before it entered the concept of either New Age philosophers or, uh, you know, uh, physicists. So it's an artistic concept. And that's exactly what this thing is. What you're looking at is two people saying goodbye on a train. But, of course, if you're standing on the platform of the train, the first thing you hear, the first presence of the train is going to be light and smoke and noise so you have the, the radiating noise and motion you first you know if you're on the platform the binario you would turn your head to look down at the train so you would see it from the front but when it passed you by you would see it from the side i love that the only thing that's clear is the number because you know a train is a train but if you're trying to catch the right train you need to know the train number and then we see this couple here and we see them over and over again and they are reaching out a window and you know grasping each other so we have this whole emotional story being told we have an expression of time being told in art and there's been a lot of discussion of whether did the futurists invent a lot of the conventions we associate with comics and i've heard this debate rage i used to teach a class on the visual culture of comics but motion lines and zips and blurred backgrounds they happen at exactly the same time in comics and so people are like where is the source? Is is it the futurists that the comics are picking up? Or are the futurists picking up on one of the comics? It's one of these age-old debates. I don't know that we'll ever answer it, but it's kind of cool. So all those blurry anime backgrounds that you see, uh, all of those are ultimately derived from somewhere in this time period, this experimental time period. And of course, he tried to do the same thing in sculpture. I love how this sculpture shows the calf, and of course, the foot is no longer there because it's moved. You get this sense of flowing in time. So it's not just this sense of experimentalism that exists in Paris. There's also other things going on elsewhere. And one of the major locus of this is going to be the Russian avant-garde. Russia had a very um, powerful avant-garde. And the first person to actually do this is uh, Kazimir Malevich, who created suprematism. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to get art down to the most essential thing, what he called the zero degree. And these are some of the first non-objective, purely geometric, abstract paintings. Now... These are 
right on the heels. These are after Vasily Kandinsky has done this, but they're really close. And what he wanted to do was to get down to the most essential form. And that's when he painted this thing, Black Square. Now, people ask me, what is it? And I say, it's a black square. <laughs> and to understand this painting, you kind of have to understand the logic. From Malevich's perspective, this black square was a more realist painting than the beautiful naturalism of the French Academy that had these, you know, scenes of vistas and just incredible photographic detail. And I know what you're thinking. How is this more real than those beautiful realistic paintings? Because those realistic paintings are a lie. They're an illusion. You know, they're just color on canvas. They are tricking you into thinking it's a window out onto a scene. It's not real. But when you look at this black square, it really is a black square. And that makes this one of the most challenging paintings in the Western canon for that reason. But he had to get to this level of extremity before he could start to build back up. And he did. He would start to build back up forms. And so we owe Malevich for all of this geometric abstraction. This, this is really a pure vision of abstraction on a level we won't see again until we get to the minimalists. So when we get to the minimalists and post-minimalists, definitely we'll be looking at this. Now, again, one of the other things that defines contemporary art is this breakaway from just art for aesthetic person. Malevich was a pure aestheticist. He believed that the art had to fit a certain form, and that's what he was going to. He wasn't trying to make a political message. But Russia was going through a spot of trouble we call the Russian Revolution at the time. And you had first the Russian Revolution, where they overthrew the Tsar, and then you have the Russian Civil War, where you have the Whites and the Reds, the Bolsheviks, fighting against each other. And a number of the people took Kazimir Malevich's ideas, like Lazitsky and others, and started moving them into the direction of revolution. That is, that art could no longer be no longer be neutral. And you can see this, that Lazitsky starts creating these really daring uh, examples of graphic design. This is a propaganda poster, you know, beat the whites with the red wedge. And yet it becomes incredibly influential to graphic design. Likewise, Gabo starts doing experimental things with uh, early forms of acrylic plastic, and plasticine. No one had ever used experimental forms. Again, new. And you have big, gigantic constructors. Vladimir Tatlin was trying to make a gigantic statue the size of a modern skyscraper. This is just a model in his studio, and even then the model is gigantic. This thing would have actually housed uh, the assembly hall for the, um, the Comintern, the international communist movement, and it would have projected communist slogans on low-flying clouds <laughs> really pretty amazing so uh this is radical radical stuff complete and total departure and radical in the sense that we are making a new society communism was brand new it was a radical departure from the past a radical departure from the czar and the empire of russia and you wanted to reinvent the world, and so this art that was trying to reinvent the art, it fused perfectly with it and made sense. Now, America, for its part, was also getting heavily involved in this. And the first place that modernism starts to enter into the American bloodstream is through Edward Steichen and Alfred Stieglitz. Uh, these guys were photographers, and they got kind of ticked off that at all the photography salons, their photographs were being judged not by other photographers, but by painters. And they said, screw it. And so they formed the Photo Secession, which was a breakaway from the main body of photographers at the time. And they started publishing a book called Camera Work that, you know, argued for pure photography, photography unhinged from this need to replicate the, the look and feel of a painting. But the most important thing they did is they set up a little gallery. And this gallery was located at 293 on Fifth Avenue, but you couldn't access it through that address. You actually had to go the next door over and access it. It was a tiny, tiny little space. So people started calling it Gallery 291, uh, even though it was really at 293. But eh, whatever. Like I mentioned before, nothing is named correctly in history. Uh, we just move on. And they would show their photographs there. But it became the first place that modern art starts to be displayed. You start to see some of the first works by um, 
uh, Constantine Brancusi, some of the first works by Picasso, uh, you start to see some of the first modernists, and they start kind of trickling in. And it's this starts to build interest in the crazy things that are going around in Europe. And people say, we need to get a hold of that, let's go take a look. And so this starts the, the lead up to the Armory Show. Now the Armory Show is put together by a couple of uh, really uh, very powerful and interesting characters. These were characters who were kind of in the American avant-garde. The American avant-garde was kind of like the Ashcan school. It was dominated by social realism. But America had really pretty traditional art. It had really very realist art and didn't have anything as crazy as what they were seeing. But Arthur B. Davies was like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of nouveau riche in America who can't break into the upper elites because they don't come from the right families or the right backgrounds. But they're just aching to show their taste, you know. Uh, and he, he says they're just aching to break out, to show their sophistication. And it just like, just like hipsters on Instagram and influencers on Instagram want to make, you know, you, you know, buy their products or, or, you know, follow the next hot thing, he realized there was a need there. There was a market. It was purely marketing. There's no doubt. This thing was a marketing, uh, you know, bonanza. And he said, if we give these people an, a, just even a peek at what's possible, they'll buy into it. And they did. And so he put together the Armory Show for like a year and a half. He and uh, Walter um, Pock, uh, went around Europe and they bought as much art as they could and what they couldn't buy they borrowed uh, they got an enormous sum of money to go loan it and they dragged it back and the people they brought back they brought everybody from Delacroix you know and romantic painters to Monet and Manet and to some of the most radical painters that we've been talking about people like uh, Matisse and uh, Malevich and others and I have to give a shout out because they actually uh, Mahan Rai Young who was the grandson of the um, LDS prophet Brigham Young, uh, was actually one of these sculptors. He was, uh, you know, pretty traditional sculptor, but he had an edge, and he was in this show too. So they just threw the net wide, and when you see the gallery, uh, it's amazing. Uh, they rented the old armory building. It was a naval armory. It was open, and they just put everything up on the walls, and it violated every rule of modern curatorship. They piled the thing higher and deeper, and everybody came in. And I think more than 200,000 people came through, and it had it hit two different cities in America, and it caused a sensation. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, probably the most famous man in the world at the time, came by and saw it and, uh, you know, really didn't think much of it. And, of course, the whole point was to create a scandal, because that creates interest, and that would bring this nouveau riche in to buy it. And some of the people that displayed in it were people like Marcel Duchamp and others. Uh, the Blue Nude by Matisse was there. Uh, it was really kind of incredible. And people really didn't know how to deal with this. It was really kind of problematic. In fact, they made fun of it. So here's Nude Descending a Staircase, which again is a kind of quasi-cubo-futurist piece that has shows the motion of the figure and breaks it down. And this was how it was parodied. This is the Rude Descending a Staircase, or Rush Hour at the Subway. There were all of these comics in the newspaper making fun of it. Uh, there were headlines that said, do not go see this show if you're drunk. <laughs> and it really did not suit most people's tastes but it succeeded. The elites, the intellectuals, particularly these nouveau riche coming up said, this stuff is intellectual and because it's intellectual, I'm gonna buy it and therefore prove myself an intellectual, it created the market. Well then, World War I happened, the Great War. Uh, 20 million people died and then in the wake of it, we have the uh, Spanish flu epidemic or pandemic where nearly 100 million people died. It was really a horrific times. It uh, started with a cavalry charge and ended uh, with an artillery barrage that uh, the 3rd Infantry, when America finally got into it, we got into it late, when America finally got into it, uh, the 3rd Infantry dropped more shells in a day than America had dropped on both sides of the American Civil War. That's how brutal this was. Machine guns, gas, chemical warfare, trench warfare, tanks, airplanes, bombs, all of the features of modern war, with the exception of maybe the atom bomb 
and biological weapons were deployed, and it was savage. And it was trench warfare locked, you know, within a mile of each other for four years. It was absolutely brutal. Uh, and so when it finally ended, empires were collapsed. The Ottoman Empire pretty much never didn't survive. The Russian Empire didn't survive. The German and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire didn't survive. France never really came back to the strength it was. And quite frankly, England got kicked in the teeth too. And it upended all this idea about God, King, God, country, and duty, and honor. And it made the world just feel kind of squalid. And it changed people's opinion of the world. It made it rather dark and nihilist in the sense that the world seems like nothing. You know, we just we just killed 20 million people in a great war. How much less, you know, is all this other stuff going? And it cast a kind of negative light on this exuberance of the age just prior and all the art experiments. So there's a number of art movements that come out of this because of this. And one of the first and most important is social realism. That people say the war is so horrible that you cannot remain neutral. Now again, contemporary art, it tends to be very, very socialist activist, it, uh, socially activist, not socialist, although there's plenty of that too. Socially activist in the sense that it takes an issue, you know, the environment, uh, crime, racism, whatever. And you can see that here. So Kate Kolwitz, for example, starts creating, creating uh, these posters, Never Again War. She starts creating, um, you know, posters that show the horrors of war. We can also see this echoed in things like photography by uh, uh, Lang in America, which show the plight of people during the Great Depression. We can also see it in the muralists, uh, the Mexican muralist movement, where they show, I love this one, because it shows uh, a skeleton giving birth to a skeleton. And who's, who is the midwife? Why, it's a modern day academic. Gotta love that. Fantastic, Orozco. That shows his opinion of, and he painted this in the, in Dartmouth, in the library of a major university in the United States. Just cheeky as hell. You gotta love it. Uh, that it shows that, you know, education and all these things are dead. So these things, you know, took a look hard edge at the world. And many of them had a mark. Many of them were adamant Marxists or fascists. Uh, it's, I know this is hard to swallow, but a lot of the fascists at the time were making progressive promises as well. And so, you know, you have people on both sides of this. And of course, uh, you know, we, we know about the horrors of both. Uh, you wound up with the horrors of fascism, but you also wound up with the horrors of, of the Cheka and the NKVD and, and uh, Kolyma, which was the first real modern concentration camp, uh, which was a gold mine, a gulag, in, uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. So it was an ugly, ugly time, and people kind of had given up on the old order and were looking for a new order, and art could no longer remain neutral because of that. One of the expressions of this was new objectivity. And new objectivity was particularly a German movement. Germany got hit by the war harder than anybody. They lost the war. Uh, they lost their government. They had to establish a new republic, the Weimar uh, Republic. And the Weimar Republic really struggled with depression, uh, hyperinflation. People had to have wheelbarrows of money just to buy bread. It was really awful. And people decided we need to take a hard look at the horrors of war. So you have things like Otto Dix painting pictures of these card players. And you can see their shattered bodies, their artificial jaws, you know, all the things that they had lost. And he's showing it out there. And people had gotten really cynical about nationalism and patriotism. And so this, this it, the new objectivity felt like, well, the social realist is too sentimental. You know, we need to accept the reality of the world and abstraction is just an, a distraction it's pointless it's just for the fun and, you know no we need to make important stuff and so a lot of their paintings focused on the horror of world war one and also the political complexity i love this one by uh, george gross because it shows the pillars of society in every way the germans felt that every major institution of their society had failed them that over here you have the clergy which was urging people on to war you had the aristocracy which had nothing but war on the mind he's actually got a cavalry charge in his brain the aristocracy you know was pushing war for the sake of glory the press 
uh, lied to them. Notice that the press has a chamber pot for a head. And business, he's got, you know, oh my gosh, it looks like a little poop emoji right up there. <laughs> the business, you know, was all about exploiting things. And so every single part of German society broke down. It's a very cynical view. And then you have people like Max Beckmann um, showing the horrors of it. The night doesn't describe any specific story, but it shows rape and horror uh, on top of this. So you've got a lot of responses. Social realism is we got to jump in there. We got to get into the trenches, metaphorically speaking, and fight for socially active causes in one way or the other. We've got to join a political cause. New objectivity is like we got to look hard eyed at the reality of the world. And then there's one that just says, ah, oh, screw it. We'll just go cuckoo. Uh, and that's Dada. And so Dada was a movie that started in the middle of the war. It started at an actual location, Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich in 1916. Hugo Ball was the person who put this together and its centers of operation are going to be then Switzerland, New York, and elsewhere. And its theory is, look, we've just seen the war, horrors of war, and it's obvious it's nonsense. <laughs> it just fell apart. And if if life is this meaningless, how could we go around and say that that art has any meaning? So they were actually an anti-art movement. Now, the tradition is that the reason they called themselves Dada is they said, well, what, what are we going to call our movement? And they said, well, any name that we pick would be meaningless. And they said, okay, so we'll just pick a name at random. They flipped through a French dictionary, stuck their finger in at random, and they found Dada. And Dada meant rocking horse. And they said, yeah, that's perfect. We'll be the Dadaists. Now, I don't believe that story for a minute because the Dadaists all lie. Uh, why wouldn't you lie if you believe the world is meaningless? Uh, in fact, they were kind of like, you know, scam artists and pranksters of their time. They wanted to tear down the art world. That was the whole point. Uh, and so they do all of these stupid, crazy things. A rocking horse is just too apt a metaphor because you get on the horse and you rock and you, you feel great, but you don't go anywhere. That's a perfect metaphor for what Dadaism was about. So we start seeing things like collage, that these are the first people to really use popular print matter and contemporary popular culture to create imagery. So when we look at pop art, Pop art, when it first starts coming out, they start calling it Neo Dada because they, they, they don't know what else to call it. Now, pop art is actually quite a bit different than Dada, but it has many of the same roots. So one of the first um, you know, parts of this was, of course, Hugo Ball uh, puts on lobster claws, puts on a, uh, an aluminized cardboard hat and cloak, and starts reading this sound or tone poem called uh, Kerawane, and it's just gibberish. It's just nonsense words. And so this, and what he was trying to say is that, you know, all the talk about the nations and the Brotherhood of Nations and all the alliances that were supposed to keep us from going to war, uh, it just fell apart. That the nations and diplomacy is just garbage. And, and it really is this kind of cynical thing, and it's absurd. And so it highlights the absurd. So Hannah Hook, uh, for example, uh, Hannah Hook uh, is there's this wonderful title, Cut with the Dada Kitchen Knife Through the Last uh, Vimar Belly uh, beer belly cultural epic in germany what a great title uh, and again it shows clips from magazines it shows um you know text uh, it has some of the most important people of the time including you know einstein and other prominent figures and political figures uh that you know it says to be data is to you know not be data uh, you know and it's kind of crazy again a very cynical take using popular culture to show how this mechanized world had led us all into chaos. And the merry prankster of all of these Dadaists was Marcel Duchamp. So Marcel Duchamp was a Frenchman who was very active in New York and elsewhere, and he would assimilate these kind of crazy ul ulterior uh, you know, personalities, these uh, aliases. This one is Aros Salavi, and that's a pun, you know, because Eros is love and Salavi is, is life. So love, it is life. So he would take on uh, this kind of, uh, you know, female identity. He had a number of identities and he was kind of a Sasha Baron Cohen of his time, pranking people and making fun of things. 
and he created paintings based on actual functional objects that he saw in storefront windows. He oftentimes just copy the catalogs directly. This is a chocolate grinder. Again, a chocolate grinder doesn't do anything. It just grinds chocolate. It has repetitive motion, so it's meaningless. A chocolate grinder is also, as a meta to grind one's chocolate, was a common euphemism at the time for <clears throat> something that we seem to have a lot of euphemisms for, like spanking the monkey, choking the chicken. So you may ask, how is you know, I mean, why is he doing this? What he's saying is that art is a form of mental masturbation. You may look at an art and say, oh, look, I appreciate this art. Therefore, I'm a very sophisticated person. But what he's really accusing you of doing, and I forgive me for being crude, is you're just jacking off. It doesn't care. You know, it's no more meaningful than, you know, I mean, anything else. It's kind of ridiculous. And he was also one of the first to kind of create these assemblages or ready-mades. You know, and the idea here is that art is something that is useless. So you take two things that are useful, like a bicycle wheel and a stool, and you put them together, and therefore they become useless, and because art has no function, therefore it must be art. The most famous example of this is his very famous work, The Fountain, which is, of course, a urinal laid on its side. The story behind this is that he was actually a member of the Society of Independent Artists. This is not the same society in... Uh, France, this is the one in New York City, was actually a member of the board. And the Society of Independence Artists was very progressive, it was wanting to do something uh, new, and generally when you submit things to a show, it's juried. That means a group of artists or critics look at your works and decide whether they're fit for the show or not. But they wanted to be very progressive, they wanted to be very open, and they said there's not going to be any juried. Uh, you know, selections. Everybody who submits is going to get in. And he said, what a great opportunity to show these people how ridiculous art is. And he went, uh, he and his friends talked about it, and they went to a plumbing supply, according to the story. They got a urinal. He wrote his uh, alias on it, R. Mutt, and they submitted it. And of course, it caused this horrible scandal. And it was, uh, and what's funny is that he, as a member of the Society of Independent Artists then wrote a defense of this work of art. So, I mean, he was actually a ringer on the inside. It's like, oh, it's a visionary piece. So it shows how, you know, absurd it is. What he was basically saying is that, hey, art has no meaning. It doesn't have any meaning. And it was essentially a prank. So if you look at this and say, that can't be art, that's ridiculous. It's a joke. It's absurd. Congratulations, you get it. That's what it's about. And that's the whole point. Now, it was he so believed that it was meaningless that when the whole thing was over he threw the urinal away and it was only later that when people realized that hey this is one of the first true conceptual pieces of art that he authorized the reproduction of this piece <laughs> so you have a reproduction uh, the first reproduction happened in 1950 uh, somebody went and got one from a pawn shop and he signed it uh, and then he authorized four more reproductions so so this is an authorized reproduction in the Tate collection. This is the only photograph of the original that we know of that was photographed by Stieglitz. Uh, but it, again, this is important because this is the first time, you know, we've, we, we talk about how contemporary art is the deconstruction of modernism and how modernism is the deconstruction of the academy. This is the first time somebody had gone so far as to deconstruct meaning. When you look at something like a Kandinsky that deconstructs objectivity, that's pretty far. But this goes even further and says art has no meaning. And, you know, really an incredible piece. Short story I got to tell about this because, again, I used to live in Philly and I went to the Philadelphia Museum, made a lot of contacts there. Uh, one of the curators told me a story about how um, uh, one of these pieces wound up in the Philadelphia Museum. Philadelphia Museum, by the way, has the greatest collection of Marcel Duchamp's works. So if you want to look at Marcel Duchamp stuff, go to the Philadelphia Museum. They have the reproduction that was made in 1950, which I consider the only one a true original because the others were manufactured to look like the original, but the other was just a toilet that somebody brought. It was really random and crazy, and Duchamp really loved that. Uh, and that thing came up on the market in the 1970s, and the Philadelphia Museum had had a special relationship with Marcel Duchamp. His, when he died, his last work was donated and to be installed in the Philadelphia Museum. So this was his most important piece. <laughs> and they said, we got to have it. Uh, and it was being sold for $2 million, which is an outrageous price at the time. Uh, but of course, museums don't just have that kind of money lying around. They got to go to donors, wealthy patrons to get the money. And, and the curator told me that at the time that it happened, 
Uh, you know, if you'd have if you'd have done this in New York, they'd have bought it in a heartbeat because New York always likes to think of itself as edgy. Uh, if you'd have done it in Boston, you could have gone to your donors and said, "Well, this is a very conceptual, intellectual piece," and Boston thinks of itself as uh, a very intellectual town. You could have sold it that way. But Philadelphia is old school. It's old money. It's old Quaker money, and you have these you know Quaker millionaires, and you're trying to talk them out of two million smackaroos to buy a toilet, and they were not having it. They were just not going to get it, and it didn't look like they could get it. And finally, the curator went in and said, look, I don't care if you hate this thing. <laughs> this is the first time this has ever happened in art history, that someone deconstructed meaning with, in this way. And so this thing is a rare historical document. Hate it or love it, it's an important historical artifact. And, of course, Philly is the town where... The Declaration of Independence was signed, it's where the Liberty Bell is, it's where Independence Hall is. They really love their history. And so they couldn't let it go. She appealed to their pride. And so even though they hated it, they bought it. It wound up. And it is. It's an incredible historical document. Well, let's get to surrealism. Surrealism. So surrealism is the movement that kind of emerges in the wake of Dadaism. Dadaism burns out. You can't keep doing these pranks and absurdity that long. And so you need something else. And again, this is the search for meaning. If you've destroyed meaning, what do you do now? And so people started looking for a new meaning. And this is where Andre Breton writes his Surrealist Manifesto. And he gets his sources from this guy, Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud wrote a book called The Interpretation of Dreams. And the argument was that everything in your dream was a reflection of your subconscious. And so this gave the Surrealists a new wellspring. We kind of had exhaust, you couldn't go back to Christianity, you couldn't go back to God and country and patriotism, you couldn't even go back to the pretty pictures of, of the Impressionists and contemporary life. That was all done. World War II just made that all just passe and irrelevant. So what you had to do is mind the self. And another thing happened, and that is the invention of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis was very instrumental in talking a lot of people in World War I out of their shell shock. If you're in the trenches for months on end, people were suffering from what we now know is post-traumatic stress disorder, but what they called shell shock at the time. Now, typically, the way you treated shell shock was you would whip them, or you would you would hang them. I mean, it was a, you know you'd hang them for cowardice or loss of nerve, or you'd you know put them in prison. But there were so many they couldn't you know imprison most of the people. So one of the first real applications of psychoanalysis was getting all of these soldiers from World War I to get back into the trenches by talking them through it. it became known as the talking cure. And this established psychotherapy as a viable alternative. And it had an enormous transformation on society. Uh, it emptied out a lot of asylums. It gave some people real hope for the first time. There weren't a lot of advances, so you got to give Freud that. Uh, a little bit crazy in the wanting to sleep with the mother department, but every, you know a lot of the other stuff was you know, a great benefit. And this actually changes the world too because it changes the idea of how you can approach yourself. I think people a hundred years ago would have thought we were extraordinarily self-centered today. Uh, you didn't talk about yourself. You didn't talk about your problems. You know, if you had a problem, you stuffed it down. You know, you were supposed to be stoic and just swallow it. But this gives them the opportunity to explore their identity, to explore the self. And the great thing about the self is it's kind of a bottomless well. Particularly if you have a lot of childhood trauma, you can turn that into a lot of art. And that's what happened. Uh, so you have a lot of artists that say, now we have a way of, of exploring it. So a lot of contemporary art, again, is very much an exploration of the artist's self and their own psyche and their subconscious that owes its origins to um, surrealism. And surrealism gave us a new language and a new way to explore meaning that didn't go back over the well-trod ground of uh, things like Christianity or the state or anything else. And so this interpretation of dreams became an excellent source. And so we have a whole variety of new images that come out. This is one of the most famous. And surrealism challenged the nature of reality. That's what surrealism means. It's the above the real. I love uh, Magritte's treachery, uh, treachery of Images uh, because it's a very famous painting. It says in French, this is not a pipe. And of course, people said, what do you mean? Of course, it's a pipe. No, it's not a pipe. It's an image of a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe. And so it shows that what we think of images are not real. This, of course, led to the very famous dreamscape images, 
where you could create nightmarish imagery or imagery that would explore your subconscious. And Salvador Dali was by far the most famous of all these who created these kind of dreamscape paintings. But we're not going to talk much about the dreamscape paintings because while they're very interesting and while the surrealism movement was very interesting, the thing that really pushed us forward was this thing called psychic automatism. Psychic automatism is, again, another thing that comes out of psychotherapy, this idea of spontaneous generation. You know, if you think of word association or looking at ink blots, the whole point of that was to try and get you out of your conscious mind so that maybe some of these unconscious, subconscious things that were bothering you would come out. Uh, that's why we call it a Freudian slip. When you say something, uh, you know, that you didn't mean to say, but it re may reveal what you th think in your subconscious. And so there were different methods of getting to this. You could do the dreamscape, explore dreamlike imagery and create new iconography. But the other way to do it was called psychic automatism. And automatism is where you would just paint. You put the pen or the paintbrush to the canvas and you just create. And perhaps the most famous of these is Jean Moreau. Jean Moreau would, a Spanish painter, again, active in France, uh, would start creating lines. And as the lines suggested forms to him, he would start creating things like cats, hands, ladders, eyeballs, things that had concrete shape. But when he started, he did not have a particular image in mind. So this became a way of spontaneous creation of accessing the subconscious and moving forward. And this is very, very important to the abstract expressionists. We'll talk more about that because by the 1930s or 40s, Miro's forms, even though he still has faces and eyes, become increasingly abstract. They become a way of expressing yourself. And this automatism becomes wedded to the expression of some of the other abstract painters, and you start to see this forming. There are other ways of, of going about this as well. For example, we have a number of people experimenting with abstraction. You have De Stiel. De Stiel is this Dutch movement of artists, Mondrian and others, uh, who are creating pure geometric abstraction. You know, you get yourself as an artist out of the process by limiting yourself to the three primary colors, white and black, and squares and rectangles, and that's it. You can see similar things in the pure, you know, abstraction of Brancusi, where he just limits things to pure, simplified shapes. Uh, in America, this starts picking up. People like Arthur Dove and Charles DeMuth. Uh, Arthur Dove, uh, right from the very beginning, started experimenting with abstraction. Uh, in 1911, 1912, he was seeing what people were doing in, in Paris, and he brought it back to the United States. And so Charles DeMuth invents precisionism, and precisionism takes scenes, uh, in this case a couple of grain silos, and divides it up into kind of abstract sectors. And so this is the American response to Cubism, but it continues onward. And likewise, George O'Keefe comes in and starts creating forms based on flowers and irises. Everybody wants to interpret these a different way, but she denied that. Uh, but, eh, feminist interpretations. Uh, you know, but if the artist denied that, I, I gotta let that go. But uh, you you see the abstraction become uh, very much a part of the expression. Now the last couple things I want to talk about here is that this abstraction finally finds a voice not just in art but in design and architecture and the place that happens is in the Bauhaus movement. So the Bauhaus movement is started by Walter Gropius who's an architect who designs this campus. He founds it in uh, Weimar, Germany, but he moves to Dessau, Germany because he has an opportunity to build in a space outside of town, outside of, of regulatory control, and he can found a school there. And in this school, they create an extreme form of design that strips all of the tradition out, that highlights the pure form of the materials. So a chair I mean, a, a building is going to be steel and glass. He innovates the curtain wall. Chairs are going to be pure steel and leather. There's no concealing of something. 
there's this honesty to the form, there's this purity to the form, and this impacts everything, and they have a holistic worldview. Walter Gropius was something of a, of a, you know, a kind of had a totalitarian worldview that everything in design should be like this, and um, the teachers and the students were there in the same school. Uh, the teachers had separate buildings for their residences, but the classrooms were directly opposite of the offices. The buildings were connected so that you never had to leave the building. If you are a student at UVU, you know, you can see those principles of design. If you go to the UVU campus, the um, air ducts and pipes are left exposed. The walls are bare concrete. Everything is connected by concourses, which is nice in the winter uh, because you don't have to walk through the snow. And those design principles that you see at UVU come from Bauhaus. This everything is that you have an honest structure. And eventually the last director of Bauhaus, Mies van der Rohe, exports this into architecture, into things like the Barcelona Pavilion. And so modernism, this pure dressed down purity of form, totally stripped from the past, no cornices, no pediments, no you know column capitals, nothing that references the historical past, that takes full advantage of all the modern materials, it comes to the fore. And it's amazing that, you know, these Barcelona chairs, which were designed by Mies van der Rohe for this Barcelona pavilion, which was the was a world expo, and this was the pavilion for Germany, uh, these, these chairs continue to be popular even today. They're still making them. They're such a, uh, a famous design. In fact, when I was at BYU, they had some original Barcelona chairs, not from the 1920s, but from the 1950s, that were actually, you know, from the original producer. And when they redecorated the HVAC in the 80s, they were going to get rid of these chairs. And some of the designers at the at BYU said no, and they 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 took them and they stuck them into their office and hid them. Uh, so I guess I just narked on them. Oh well, never mind. But so the simplicity of design. Now what's really interesting is that. All of this would eventually come to its full fruition in America and Europe in the 50s, in the 40s and the 50s in the post-war period. But this kind of extreme pure modernism was very early, 1920s we're talking. 1920s, we don't think of the 19, we think of 1920s being Art Deco, we don't think of them being, you know, this austere. So why didn't modernism and all of this come together to create the triumphal modern moment in Europe, well, Nazis. I hate these guys. Uh, favorite Indiana Jones uh, quote. Uh, and the Nazis ruin everything. They shut down the Bauhaus school. Um, they make the uh, uh, expressionist painters and new objectivity painters uh, flee for their lives. Max Beckmann was actually a professor in Frankfurt, but he lost his position when the Germans, when the Nazis came to power. And so uh, Bauhaus gets shut down. Uh, and not only that, but all of this experiment that had been happening in Europe, where you know Germany was a major hub of the avant-garde, gets completely shut down. And not only does it get shut down, it gets repudiated. Uh, the Nazis hold these exhibitions called degenerate art. And in these exhibitions, you can see Kokoschka and Nolda and also the Dadaists hung up on the walls and mocked. Uh, you have Hitler and Goebbels come through and, and laugh at them. And they see this as degenerate and fallen. And of course, they replaced it with the cold and lifeless fascist art that they preferred, you know, designed by people like Albert Speer, who was going to bulldoze most of Berlin and replace it with this Volkthal, this terrifying, uh, you know, abomination of neoclassical architecture and fascism put together. And so the experiments of surrealism, the experiments of abstraction, the experiments of early modernism come to an abrupt end. And from the early 1930s on, you have all of these exiles and they flee and they flee first to places like Paris, but then Paris because of the war, 1939, uh, quickly falls. Then they flee to England and England comes under the blitz in 40 and 41. And there's only one more place to go and that's America. And so New York City in particular becomes a city of exiles. And many, many of the artists that we've been talking about wind up in New York City. And all these ideas of, you know, expressionism, abstraction of the subconscious, of automatism, 
they all come together in the melting pot of America and unfortunately because America is fighting through its own depression in the 1930s and then through World War II the art world is kind of on pause it's placed on pause for about a decade but once World War II is over it's like you know a it's like a wildfire it just takes off and all these ideas come to the fore and modernism which had been struggling you know had its coming out party but then had a wild bender and you know and fell off the rails and then got driven out of town by radicals <laughs> and all these things you know modernism is just a wayward teenager so, you know anyway but moving on uh can you tell him a parent <clears throat> anyhow uh, modernism finally comes into its own it grows up and it takes over and that's where we get to abstract expressionism that's where we have this moment but that's the next lecture but it's coming up shortly so we'll see that next time thanks so much bye bye